everyone. Welcome to the second week of SOCH 365 and your second lecture. Uh, tonight, we're going to start a two-part series on the theorists themselves. Um, we'll have a little, talk a little bit more about August Comte, and we'll talk a little, uh, little bit about the theorists you're going to be studying this week as well. Um, but this is week two, and it's that we're presenting on the theorists part one. Okay, so welcome to week two. So first of all, uh, just just to kind of give you a little bit of background, uh, uh, what you studied last week, just a reminder, the study of human and social behavior, the study of human social behavior dates back to the beginnings of recorded history. I mean, uh, if you're just looking at in general at how people are speculating about how each other, how people will be, behave, philosophers, teachers, doctors, stockbrokers, religious and political figures, politicians, they, they would all speculate and observe human reactions to social influences. And some of the big names, historically speaking, Plato, Aristotle, the Emperor Marcus Aurelius. St. Thomas Aquinas, Shakespeare, excellent study in human, <laughs> human behavior. Um, but sociology as a recognized discipline did not emerge uh, until just before the Industrial Revolution, as you studied last week. And sociology gave us a forum of study for scholars who wanted to examine the effects of urbanization, political upheaval, civil sanitation, etc. So you've already read a little about August Comte, who uh, really is considered the father of sociology, the, the, the founder of sociology. But let's, let's just go through a few prime points about him because he, he, he can turn up throughout the whole course and I want to make sure everybody's uh, uh, thinking of Comte when you think of uh, the other theorists to come. So August Comte, and one thing I would really recommend is that students think when they read about these theorists, think about when the person lived and where, and what, what was their social environment when they were growing up. And Comte grew up in the aftermath of the French Revolution. And he coined the term sociology. He was a natural scientist and mathematician. But according to Comte, Society could be studied using the same methods as the natural sciences, the same methods as botany, chemistry, etc. And that, you know, today we're kind of, we understand that, but that was really a revolutionary, uh, you know, uh, idea at, a, at, at the time that you could study people. And people's behavior, people, you know, uh, people's society and the cultures that within it and subcultures, etc., through the same processes as uh, chemistry, um, biology, uh, you know, the, 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 the geology. And Kant is credited with, of course, quite a few concepts, but let me just kind of, because this gets the ball rolling for several different theories, including structural functionalism. And uh, this week, you're, you're really getting uh, you know, neck deep into structural functionalism. And I want to make sure that you understand that this, that Kant was really one of the ideas, what was very important in launching, of course, all these social theories. But structural functionalism, you're going you're gonna to be hearing Kant, the echo of Kant when you read about structural functionalism. So Kant is credited with the concepts of social statics and social dynamics. So social statics are the structure of society. Okay, every society has some kind of political structure. It could be three people getting together and deciding where we're going to migrate tomorrow. Um, it could be uh, a, a very complex hierarchical system, uh, uh, you know, a bureaucracy. Uh, but there is some kind there. Every society has its social statics, has some kind of political structure, some kind of economic structure, some kind of family structure, uh, religious structure or belief structure of that sort, uh, etc. OK, social dynamics. These are the processes and forms of change within society. So how that 
political system manifests itself, that political uh, static or structure manifests itself. That's the dynamic part. That changes over time. Okay. So Kant plugged sociology as a science, not as philosophy, and this kicked off the classical period in sociology. Okay, and I know you read about him last week, so I'm going to segue to Durkheim. So this is kind of the economy tour of the uh, primary theorists uh, whom you're going to be reading um, this week. So Emile Durkheim, it's not Emily, uh, not a gal. <laughs> there weren't a lot of women in uh, social in science period at those times, and um, so it's it, you're, you're going to be reading about a couple as we move along. But really, classical social theory there just were not there weren't a lot of women in science period, um, and sociology was no different. Uh, so Emile Durkheim, uh, years 1858, 1917. And Durkheim was uh, cr critical in developing what we now uh, call our modern version of structural functionalism, but he was really at the root of that. Now, he was at the, one thing I'd like to point out is he was at the root of it for the French. Uh, these ideas, were, you know, the, the, the countries would actually, or, or empires would actually compete with each other. So while this was going on in France, while Emile Durkheim was holding up kind of the French end of structural functionalism in France, there's somebody we don't really talk about much, and I'm not going to test you on him. I just want you to realize that there were competing theorists. There's a structural functionalist in England, Herbert Spencer, and he's actually credited, uh, he, or, or he kind of, kind of is brushed under the rug because we don't, I mean, his ideas were not at all aligned with what we think of today for the most part. But he was critical in developing structural functionalism and in, in its origins. Um, the, the thing is, though, with, with Herbert Spencer, we don't talk about him much because he was, uh, sociology usually seeks to solve problems, to, address, to identify problems um, and help solve them or help, you know, there, there's usually some kind of applied interest in it. It's not, I, ideally we're not just explaining social behavior, which is great. I mean, don't get me wrong about that, but trying to help, uh, you know, the, the help solve social problems is a big part of modern social, uh, uh, social sciences. So with that in mind, uh, Spencer's kind of uh, persona non grata because his ideas were if you uh, follow the, the concept of survival of the fittest, social problems will go away. They will take care of themselves. Uh, so Spencer was proposing basically, I mean, and, the, and the aristocracy just loved him, basically said, look, if you stop with all these social programs, programs for the poor and that sort of thing, the poor will, you know, the problem will take care of itself. And it's, it's pretty cold. I, it's, it kind of smacks of, of a Christmas carol where, um, you know, Scrooge is you know, saying, are there no workhouses? Are there no, you know, let's get the poor out of here. You know, it's just kind of a concept. That, and I, I'd like to think that, that Spencer was more naive than he was, uh, you know, it wasn't necessarily a vicious person. He, he was born in England and was a contemporary of Emile Durkheim. And what he saw was uh, very limited compared to what Durkheim saw. I mean, Spencer w grew up in a you know in, in a family in a family that uh, had you know he had everything he needed. He was not on the street. He was not seeing that there were real barriers to uh, being poor. That he thought that struck that you were actually hurting society if you tried to help the poor. So the aristocracy loved him. We do not. So we don't talk about Herbert Spencer, but I wanted to throw him out there at least so you guys would know that there were competing concepts of, of structural functionalism at this time, just like with other theories, that there were multiple theorists in different countries, uh, all, all putting forward their, um, their approach 
to a theory. So, but Emil Durkheim is the person who is credited most with structural functional theory, theory uh, and its de early development. And um, his years, he was born in 1858, lived to 1917. So he saw basically, uh, he, he, you know, did not live to see the end of World War I. Um, but you get an idea of what Durkheim saw. What he saw was uh, this, this, the, the explosion of the Industrial Revolution at the turn of the century. He saw a lot of exploitation of workers and uh, uh, the masses and of the poor. But Durkheim was a structural functionalist, and he was primarily concerned with how morality and religion uh, could serve as a foundation for common values. And these common values would promote social integration. So he was, he was very, very uh, much, well, let's, let's take his uh, fascination with suicide. Okay, and he identified and was fascinated by types of suicide. Um, up till then, you know, people that looked at suicide as a spiritual issue, they looked at it, and they still do, but there's, there's, con he was really the first to point out that there are different kinds and different reasons, different motivations for suicide. Not everybody who commits suicide is crazy, or the, you know, and that's how they were labeled back then. It's not just things for depression or that's it. There's, there's also sacrificing yourself for your species, uh, sacrificing yourself for, you know, in, in the case of war, in the case of, uh, uh, you know, protecting your family or friends, this, this kind of altruistic suicide. There, there are many different, and you're going to be reading about this this week, so I don't want to go into it too uh, deeply, but Again, he would, he would look at how common values would kind of promote social integration and how people put, you know, often values above their own individual lives. Um, and using comparative methods, Durkheim found different suicide patterns or rates for different regions of countries and for members of some ethnic groups and some religions, variables such as marital status, living in times of flux, all these have bearings on this. So yeah, read about him this week and, and some of his studies. And, and uh, I think it, he kind of cracked open some, uh, some opportunities also for an even younger discipline, which was psychology and uh, social psychology, which is kind of the marriage of sociology and psychology, although it has more psychology than sociology. Okay. Another theorist you're going to be reading about this week is Karl Marx. Um, now, his, his period, he lived uh, 1818 to 1883. He's a little bit older than Durkheim. Uh, Marxism should not be confused with what today we know today as communism, okay? That was, that was a very different concept, okay? Um, Communism is the marriage of totalitarian uh, totalitarianism with uh, socialism. Okay, just like uh, fascism is kind of the marriage of totalitarianism with capitalism, capitalist ideals. Um, but both are totalitarian. Now, Marx saw he did see and and believed that uh, there was exploitation of the masses and that the people would have to rise up and take over. But he also had this, this view that um, it's, 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 almost, it's, it's, it's kind of utopian and sweet and it's almost naive that eventually when people redistributed wealth, there would be no reason uh, for people to have government in the end when they evolved to a certain point. And at that point, people would just get along communally, uh, that there would be no need for, uh, for a government with power over people like this, that there would be a sharing of power. So, but Marx really saw society 
as abusive to the lower socioeconomic classes. And he thought that through communal ownership, greed and selfishness would d disappear, or at least kept in check, and the world and its societies would become a sort of utopia. And he also believed that the only way society could redistribute its wealth and resources was by means of taking it away forcibly from its present owners, and that is by revolution. Okay. So he developed what we call social conflict theory. Conflict theory or social conflict theory is based on the view that society is a system characterized by social inequality and social conflict that generates social change. And Marx believed that social conflict was at the core of society and was the vehicle of social change. Okay, he believed that society is based on economic factors, which is competition for resources. So power uh, was basically how, you know, who controlled resources. Now, something that I would like to bring, uh, bring up is the conflict in conflict theory does not necessarily refer to something destructive, but is a vehicle for the refinement of, of, of social change. So he saw it kind of as, um, as, as forging gold. You have to get the impurities out. And that is a, a violent, uh, dramatic process through fire. So he really believed that over time with through this kind of uh, you know, inequality and then uh, it's kind of a revolution to equalize things and kind of this, this, this uh, cycle um, that eventually things would become as he thought they should be, which was sort of what we view it, we would call a utop utopian society. Okay, but one thing that you got to keep in mind is what he was proposing, the conflict in conflict theory doesn't necessarily mean people coming at each other with baseball bats. It could be striking coal miners versus big business or a sit-in, uh, people marching for civil rights. Um, but yeah, the, the main thing to remember is that instead of society working as a holistic unit, as in structural functionalism, Marx believes society, he viewed society as unstable and divided by social class, race, ethnicity, gender, education, money, etc. Okay. Now, uh, Marx believed that the mode of production is the base of society. The mode of production structures human consciousness. Um, so for Marx, um, let's see. Marx actually, Marx said, all that men say, imagine, conceive, etc., uh, including such things as politics, laws, morality, religion, metaphysics, all of those, um, you, you, you put those together, that's kind of your mode, that is your mode of production, okay? So for Marx, the superstructure is generally dependent on that mode, the, on the modes of production that dominate in a given period. Okay, mode of production is everything that goes into the production of the necessities of life. That's a simplistic de definition. The mode of production is everything that goes into the production of the necessities of life. Okay. There we go. Okay. <laughs> this includes the, the number one productive forces. So it includes labor, instruments, and raw material. Okay. Mode of production also includes the relations of production. That is the social structures that regulate the relationships between humans in the production of goods. And one of the things you can you can see is that Marx was looking um, at things like relationships between people and how people work together, you know, who know each other, are part of the same family, how oligarchs, you know, uh, develop, 
oligarchies and how uh, these these same you know the kind of network of people hold power how do they work together so the re relations of production are the social structures that regulate the relationships between humans in the production of goods okay that's just one example Okay, so now let's take Marx and Durkheim's ideas and kind of compare them about social change. So the functionalist versus the conflict perspective for the modern era. Well, functionalist Durkheim was forced, focused on keeping social institutions stable and orderly to preserve society, but he argued that aspects of social life can become dysfunctional over time when they no longer contribute to social life um, and the ongoing survival of a society. So first society changes with the rise of the division of labor, and then it changes with adjustments to preserve stability. Now Marx, his conflict theory, conflict theorist Marx did not focus on preserving the status quo, but on conflict to undermine the status quo, which he believed preserves stability by coercion and domination. So for Marx, capitalist modern societies produce inequality. There are always losers and winners, and the exploited and the exploiters. Okay, uh, social change occurs when there is class conflict and struggle, and those with power have to surrender part of their power, or better yet, from Marx's perspective, are forced out of power by a revolution that changes the relations of production and the overall mode of production, okay? So that's the presentation this week. That's our lecture this week. Please uh, watch the week three lecture when week three rolls around or a little before if you want to, to see the next presentation on uh, the different theorists we're studying in this class, the major theorists. But thank you so much for coming. Have an absolutely great week, too.